Welcome back to Kerrigan Fishing. I'm Adam Kerrigan. I was joined on this day by my friends Eric and Rodney, aka Tightlines 302, at a location none of us had ever fished before. It was beautiful, but it was tough. Mosquitoes were out in force. We weren't going to let the bugs or the muck keep us from figuring this new place out. Uh. <laughs> Is that off? That's off of your wake, right? Looping mode is engaged. After the remnants of Hurricane Ida brought tornadoes and flooding, high turbidity and drastically cooler air water temps made it difficult to get a bite. We made the best of it we could. Put it right on top of you. It's gotta be a turtle. All right. No good. It gives us an opportunity for a really good presentation on a honker frog, right? Which is to cast out off the shoreline and then gradually work your way in closer to shore or work your way out to try to figure out exactly where the fish are suspending, whether they're back in vegetation or they're farther out looking for food. That's not what I wanted at all. What's up, man? Lots of activity. Just trying to see stuff up there. Well, it's been a pretty disheartening morning so far. We're seeing activity but it doesn't seem to be interested in biting anything that we're throwing. And it is the second time in the last three days that I've been out where that no bite pattern has emerged after we've just been hit with a couple pretty significant rain events. The most recent, I believe, being Ida. It came up through here. There were tornadoes that were reported throughout the eastern shore of Maryland and even up in Cecil County, Maryland, my stomping grounds. We had a cold front that came up. We had temperatures drop by 20, 25 degrees overnight after the storm. And that has an impact on the way the fish behave. I mean, I can tell you the water here, I mean, I've never fished this spot before, but the water here is significantly colder than the water we were fishing before the tornadoes hit. But I just got a phone call from my buddy Eric. He's up ahead. He says that we need to uh, paddle up about a quarter mile and there's a pretty good spot in front of us. Let's go give it a shot. Ooh. Morning, Bob. They are just not interested in the frogs today. Man, this pattern is tough. I haven't done a time check yet, but I figure we've been out here for about an hour. Seen plenty of activity. No bites, no short strikes, no nothing. Even though I know I'm throwing at fish. But that's how it is, you know, with snakehead. Like, you, 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 some days you'll go out and it doesn't matter what you throw, you're gonna get obliterated. Top water bite is on fire, subsurface bite is on fire. You can do no wrong. Other times you go out and they're just shut down. They're not interested in eating. And it could be for any one of a hundred different reasons. It could be that they've gorged themselves on whatever the hatch happens to be in the moment that there's an abundance of bait fish and any presentation that you try to come up with isn't gonna work <laughs> because it's just not a fishable pattern. But 
you stick with it, you keep doing what you can, you pay attention to what's going on around you, and you turn your failures into successes. That's the name of the game. Fishing is the thing that gives you an opportunity, unlike anything else, that is to firsthand, like in the moment, being present, observe cause and effect. And you either pay attention to what nature is telling you and you succeed or you ignore it and you fail. Because ultimately what the success is about, the real measurement of it, is whether or not I've figured out my surroundings, my environment, the things happening around me, whether I can accurately read or understand the state of the world. And I guess in that way, fishing is a great teacher because it seems like a lot of us sure do like to ignore the state of the world and just keep doing whatever it is that we feel like doing instead of doing what works. That's enough of that. All right, time hack. It is almost nine o'clock in the morning. Been on the water for two and a half hours and not even so much as a nibble. <clears throat> Did I say nibble? I meant nibble. All right. The water is significantly clearer out here in this channel. Let's see what we can do. Feels like it's time for a snack. I like the pet trail mix. But I do it for a bunch of different reasons. Yeah, it's got energy. All that other good stuff. But the, uh, the truth of it is, eating trail mix makes me think of my dad. When I was a kid, he used to take me fishing. We didn't go very often, but the times that we did go were pretty special. And he always used to make sure that even if we were just going out for the day, that we had what he called survival rations, right? The survival rations could be, you know, trail mix, or it could be uh, Snickers bars, some kind of treat, something with chocolate in it, whatever. <laughs> that, uh, you know, we could snack on if things didn't go well. My dad wasn't the greatest fisherman. <laughs> anyway, I remember there was an occasion where we uh, were waiting in a car for my mom to come out of her office. And uh, <laughs> we'd been sitting there for about 10 minutes. And my dad looked back at my brother and I very, very seriously. Well, I don't think anyone's coming for us. We may have to dive into the survival rations. And again, I mean, we'd been out there for 10 minutes. He was just feeling a little bit snackish. So <laughs> there we sat in the car, eating Snickers bars, survival rations. Whenever he made trail mix, he used to call it GORP, like G-O-R-P. I don't know where he got that term. I've only heard it a handful of times. Had to have peanut, it had to have raisins, it had to have M&Ms. Yeah, I think it was pretty much it. We stuff it all in a bag and we take it out. Gorp. A few days ago was the anniversary of my dad's passing. And this time of year, I always uh, find myself cherishing the little things that help me to remember how much you love me. Like trail mix.
memories like those, that's that's what fishing is. Whether it's for snakehead or bass or catfish or perch or crappie or sea trout, whatever. It's about the creation of memories. It's about going out and doing something. Giving yourself things to look back on. And know that even though some people might think that you wasted a day, you didn't. You spend an entire day being present, a part of what surrounds you. That was good. I needed that. Let's go catch some fish. Yes. Yes. Let's go. Oh my God. You're not a cannon by any stretch of the imagination, but I'll take it. Wow. Okay. Wow. All right. So what happened? I saw this guy moving on the edge of some lily pads and some uh, duckweed that's been built up here along the side. I saw motion, I cast past it, and I worked the lure back through nice and slow. And right as I brought it through the point where I had seen the fish before, he hit. So they are moving out as the water gets warmer. They are sitting on the edges of this vegetation and they are ambushing. So the presentation that we're using here with a lure like a chatterbait or a blade waker, um, it's that's the ticket. That's what they're looking for. Now, got a nice solid hook set here. Oh no. I just lost my fish slippers. It's just been that kind of week, man. All right. Let's see what we can do here. Get the hook out. Come up. by any stretch of the imagination but a pretty gorgeous specimen I will take it it's what it's all about folks stick with it pay attention to what's going on around you bye And you'll succeed. Man, it is good to get the skunk off of the boat. Holy cow. The lure that I have tied on, tied on right now, this is a, a blade waker. It's manufactured by Tekel, right? And it's it's a pretty unique lure. Like it, In a lot of ways, it functions like a chatterbait. Um, but this blade that sits on the front is unique in that it channels water down. So depending on how you retrieve it, it actually keeps the lure up in the water column almost right at the surface if you're going fast enough. So unlike other chatterbaits where they have a tendency to sink and you, know, you have to retrieve them quickly and be very, very conscious of where they sit in the water column relative to vegetation, uh, the, the blade waker just kind of inherently wants to stay up. And the motion that it's got on it, because of the way this blade is shaped, it's a it's it's a wobbling motion, and you can vary 
that wobbling motion by changing the way that you hook into it. Like in this case, I'm using two clips. Don't make fun of me. I try to be efficient when I'm fishing. You can hook it on the underside of the lip or you can push this through and you can hook it on the upper side of the lip. One of them gives you a more pronounced wobble. The other one is nice and tight. So when everything else is failing, I am learning that the Blade Waker is the right lure to throw. Man, it feels good to have gotten that, that skunk off the boat. Holy cow. They're in here. I knew they were in here. Now we're gonna try to build a pattern. Let's go. Well, friends and family, it's looking like that's going to be it for today. Really, you know, tough bite, but it's really not much to complain about. I mean, considering the weather that we've had, I mean, we had tornadoes blowing through Maryland, you know, not even, what, half an hour from here, severe flooding, you know, all kinds of issues all throughout the Delaware and the uh, Susquehanna watersheds, all the way down into the bay. Bays, like, to have gotten out here and seen that everything's in good shape and spent some time in the sun and, you know, gotten a, a fish to actually commit in tough conditions, there's a lot of reward in that. And I think there was a lot that was learned today. So, I hope you enjoyed our adventure together and I'd like to remind you it's never too late to care again.